So often, you know, even we can see what seems so bad is a blessing. I have a friend and uh, her husband doesn't relate to her as he should. He's critical, he's difficult. Not appreciative. And yet she is becoming lovelier and lovelier. And I think, how does she tolerate him? Why doesn't she leave him? Shouldn't she leave him? And it's a nonsense. God will take him away in the fullness of time. When she's perfected. I was going to say she's doing, but really in a sense she's having had done to her exactly what she needs. And she's becoming more and more spiritual, more and more spiritual instead of religious. And in spite of all the doctrine that she believes in, <laughs> she's becoming a fine person. God works in wondrous ways, you see. I was flat about, mm, I don't know, a good few minutes ago now. I listened to just the next two, or well, the current two, of te seven recordings that I'm publishing. You know, getting actually ready for YouTube just to put straight on. And I was totally uninspired in my approach to them. But I thought, well, I don't have any other leading and listening to my recordings blesses me. And now I've been replaced, accelerated to Awareness of his loveliness again, our Heavenly Father. And I know it sounds conceited really, but so blessed by listening to these two recordings. Hang on a minute, I'll give you the numbers of them. And I can't without losing my place in this one and so on. And, oh yes, I can. 1190s, S1197 and 11S1198. With the titles Practice and the second one is Yoga. We're very busy doing, aren't we? And I'm so lifted by, by the time I got is it completely through the second one I'm just flying again why well I just mechanically did the next step because this is what has me recover normally and normal it is I feel so blessed with the love of God again it puts me on track. Now, it might not put you on track. I hope to goodness it does, but it might not. But you have something that puts you on track. It might be singing. So often for me has been worshipping in the past. Christian songs, I didn't even accept the theology of much of what I was singing. But I knew how much it meant to some people of old, so to speak. And I could enter into their earnest, fervent desire to love God 
God as they understood him, of course. What else could it be? Can only spend what they have in their purse. Love you, Heavenly Dad. Love you. And now you see, because I have this comforting, if you call it that, it's an extremely modest way of saying something fantastic, referring to something fantastic. That lovely feeling of the assurance of his presence and loving kindness. You see, let me put it this way, if God were physically as a person sitting in the room next to me at the bed here, what would be the tremendous bit would be realizing he's here, having the assurance of his love and kindness. Well, you can have that now. You don't need his physical presence. In your view, he's there anyway. He could be there. How wonderful. I would say it's making God in our own image. And this used to be an appalling criticism. A disaster, and a, a, a description of the lost. And what do I find? Trusting that God is all that I truly value gives me an overpowering love of Him. And my trust in Him, of course, includes that He'll guide me through all that I might misunderstand. Perhaps it's a lot. Perhaps it's a little. It makes no difference to him. He's God. Wonderful. Capable beyond our imagination. And loving too. Beyond our experience. Our experientiality, I want to say our ability to experience at present, because we're just kids. I'm back to my image, aren't I, of my friend and his daughter resting on his chest, just happy to be laying on him as he lounges on the sofa, settee. And I just think what a perfect example to me of true relationship, of love, of assurance and peace, and goodness and blessing. Love you, Heavenly Dad. And the wonder, the joy, the loveliness is I can have this now. I don't need Krishna or Jesus to come into the room, of course it would give a fantastic lift, just as Paramahansa describes meeting Babaji, the first time I'm thinking of at present, because I've just been reading it yesterday, again, my friend pointed out at the meeting last night, the importance of reading that which gives you blessing again and again. She's been reading the earlier bit where there's a palace materialized in, in the Himalayas, uh, whether it's vision or whether it's, you know, physical reality, I, I don't know, I know not, but that's what's being described. And whether it's fact or fiction, makes no difference to me. I get the message, which is that's what 
Paramahansa has experienced in his mind of Lahiri's account. Whether it's matched by the transitory reality or not is hardly the point. What is the point is that he was fantastically lifted by it, the experience. And it's still an inspiration, surprisingly, because it looks a bit childish. Sand castles in the air, you know, materializing a palace to satisfy some karmic mm, thread that needs to be dealt with. So the logic and reasoning runs, according to Paramahansa. But my friend was inspired by reading it again, and I don't think she was just saying it. She might have been. <laughs> but it was still true. <laughs> More things in heaven and earth than you or I have ever dreamed. My mum's saying, very secular saying, I think, but very true. Secular can hit the nail on the head, so to speak, at times. Being very, very to the point and helpful. Breath of fresh air in some ways. Especially if one's been bogged down with a religious dogma for too long. Listen to my friend last night, she gave me a discourse on the importance of trusting God in all circumstances thanking him for good and the bad, that it's all God's grace. What a perfect talk. I was flat and disappointed this morning that someone else knows something that I thought I knew but so personally and selfishly and narrowly. I've got this and other people haven't, and some people have. <laughs> My sort of first, has she stolen it from me? It's so exactly what I believe. <laughs> and I'm flat. I'm like jo um, yeah, Jonah sitting under the fig tree, sulking. I should have been delighted and, and rejoicing that Nineveh's repented. But in instead I'm sitting there peeved. <laughs> I rebuke myself not too heavily I accept I'm a child just sort of childish behaviour you accept you expect rather of a child isn't it I just love you dad I just love you for your kindness your grace and your care just love you too in that it hits me yet again as it did yesterday before in the morning. That it's your grace and your kindness, your love and your provision that brings us to maturity for the kingdom of heaven. It's not our practice. We put our hope in our practice, my hopes in you, Lord. May my hope ever be. In a sense, I want to say purely in you. Of course, we do it together. Like with my, my wives, we did everything together because what's the point in doing it if it's going to be apart? The meaning of my life is that we do things together. So, I do practice. I mean, I've done my triangular breathing this morning. Mm, probably did half an hour of it. A bit more, 40 minutes. Arguments say 80 breaths. Should I do 100? Not really. I'm too busy loving him now. What's more important? 
another hundred breaths. Practice. Or just rejoicing in the awareness of him. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Thank you, Heavenly Dad. So I've put together another recording. 15 minutes, quarter of an hour, just like that. Rolled off. And I know in my heart it's a blessing. You might say, Marshall, it's one of your endless repetitions. <laughs> you can't say 3,000 unique things. I've published something like 3,000 now. Something like that. I'm losing count and it doesn't matter. It loses meaning when the numbers get too big, don't they? It's like um, Creonanda's publishing. I mean, he's published so much you don't read any of it. <laughs> I don't want to be dismissing. Dismissive. <laughs> but I know how he feels in a way. I think I can imagine how he feels anyway. Yeah. Thank you, Heavenly Dad. My soul longs for you. My soul longs for you. Nothing else will do. Nothing else will do. Love you, Dad. Thinking of times with mum when I was a kid, it didn't have to be exciting all the time. If we're going shopping, fine. If we're not, because it's raining, say, we'll stay in. Fine, we'll listen to something on the radio together. Sure, we'll do our dressmaking, say. I might be doing embroidery, would you believe it? She taught me to embroider, taught me to knit. But often I just played. And, I, and most of the time, always on the floor. I was always on the floor. And it's a great thing always being on the floor instead of in furniture. When you want to just rest, you just do automatically. You just lay there and think. And then you think, oh, I think I'll play with so-and-so. And, and you do. Can I get you a cup of tea? I'll go in the kitchen and get mum a cup of tea. Do a digestive biscuit with butter on and a, a little bit of cheese. And we sit and have tea and biscuits together. Probably the second time that day. Might be the third. <laughs> the day would be what it is. It didn't matter whether it was good and exciting or, or not good and exciting, it was still good. Where else would I want to be? An incredible contentment to be with the person who, from your point of view, is perfect company. And you are to them too. She was just happy to be at home with her boy, Marshall. What did she call it? Floss, Bubba, Bubby, Bubba, Marsh, Marshall, very, very rarely Marshy, Willow, Floss. <laughs> How amazing. I just called her mum. In her more worldly times, she didn't really appreciate being called mum, I think, because this was not the beautiful young woman that she has been. You know, the romance in every man's heart. The sort of person that comes into the room and every man's head turns. And every woman's head does too. I hope he doesn't 
take a liking to her more than me in, the, in so many hearts. And some, of course, where the marriage had got to such a point they didn't give a damn, so to speak, whether he ran off after someone else or not. Mum was fantastically attractive, full of life and full on. Very worldly, you would say, but a great blessing to the very worldly who needed just such experience. But her real life was at home with her son, Marshall. We could just weed a flower bed together. Do the washing together. Cook the supper together. Thank you, Heavenly Dad, for her loving kindness. Thank you, Mum, too. For it strengthened me for the whole of my life. By your grace and her grace and goodness too. Thank you, Heavenly Dad. There was a song, I Can't Get No Satisfaction, it was called. A terrible title, wasn't it? They were a ghastly group, the Rolling Stones. I mean, they delighted in being ghastly, totally non conforming. <laughs> utterly conforming to the non-conformist view of youth at the time, of course. And they were a tremendous hit. I can't get no satisfaction. I try and I try. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is how the lyrics went, would you believe? <laughs> they were a grotesque group. <laughs> they delighted in being grotesque. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh, what a disgusting message. I mean, I wasn't into religion or anything at the time, but I just thought, oh, I so do not take to this group. I can't bear watching it. I was only a teenager, of course. Well, your life can be the absolute reverse of that. And you know, of course, really, that's what the song was about. It was that ordinary life seemed to be so utterly empty for them, no matter what they did. It didn't give them the answers. What could be a more holy message than that? To realize this world in all its glitter and all its opportunities is very instructive but it's instructive of the value of something else and of the lack of value in the transitory pleasures here and so something that was so secular so repellent was actually so to the point can't get no satis satisfaction. Of course, when I think of it now, it's got the negative in, no satisfaction. You would think they were singing, I can't get any satisfaction. I can't remember the word specifically now, but isn't that an interesting point? The no was in there. Strictly speaking, by the logic of language, if you can't get no satisfaction, then you can get satisfaction. And of course you can. You can have life eternal, here and now. Look, I'm going to labour a point. It's not through endless practice. 
you can endlessly practice and have no end to endlessly practicing. It's that at some point you capitulate and you just feel in your heart, I just long for you, God. I'm sick of all this practice. I just want to be with you. And it may come to you that you are with him. Just thank him for it. Your soul longs for him. My soul longs for you. My soul longs for you. Nothing else will do. You've made it, mate. You're in the reality of being the devotion to God. All that you conceive of and can't conceive of, of his goodness and loveliness and wonderfulness. Quite simply, love you, Dad. Thank you, Heavenly Dad.